Last year, uh, uh, in 2016, I got a chance to do some oral history interviews as part of the work I do with the Southwest Collection. Um, and uh, it was like pulling teeth to get Louise to talk about herself. Uh, her parents had been well-to-do, and then um, for one thing and another, uh, during the time period of the Depression and um, other factors, they were less well-to-do. And she was had their, she had siblings, and so their uh, folks worked very hard to give them opportunities, which in the 1930s was, that, that took work. It was a difficult time. Uh, so there are great stories about that. But the one that just jumped out at me was her casually mentioning that uh, as a senior trip, you know, celebrating her graduation from high school, she got to go to the Olympics. Well, it was the 1936 Olympics. The picture of the opening of the 11th and greatest Olympic Games of modern times is one that will live forever in the memories of those who had the privilege of witnessing them. Crowds were massed in the Berlin streets long before the scheduled opening of the ceremonies. From the Lust Garden to the entrance of the stadium, the streets were one long stream of color. Green flagpoles bearing a scarlet banner with a swastika in the center were spaced every 50 feet. It was spooky because the whole, you were in this yeah. crowd of hundreds of thousands of people in the stadium and this goofy little thing coming down, you know, pressing down the stairs and, and, uh, and then, then to have uh, all these countries come in, you know, and the, oh, the, the pomp and circumstance and all, it was just so wonderful. And the, all these people were, were, would, you know, everybody, you've seen it on television a hundred yeah. times, but it does, it didn't feel like that. In real, it was spooky. The two nations led by the Greeks, as is their right for having originated the games. When they had the, the parade or whatever that comes in, the in, entrance that mm -hmm. come right, right. right. See, Hitler was, he, I could have touched him almost. Really? I could have jumped over a few people, but he was always coming down that big center thing, you know, and then he was giving his speech and everybody was, oh, it was just, of course we didn't know what he was saying, but he was crazy. Immediately, the band stopped the march it was playing and broke into Deutschland über alles. The audience rising promptly... From For a person to have lived such a rich life, that that's not sort of the pinnacle of things that they can recount to you. That says a lot about Louise. We lived in a little village uh, called Bronxville. Bronxville? You know, it, it's not the Bronx. It's, right. It's a little village, one mile square. Wow. And imagine now a childhood where you were allowed to wander. We went, we walked to school every day, of course, at home. Mm -hmm. But we could do anything as long as we came home before dark, you know, yeah. after school. Or if we wanted to play with somebody, we could say, well, we're going to stop off at so and so's. Imagine that. Louise married and came out here uh, to West Texas when uh, Texas Technological College was a small school and it was very dusty here in Lubbock and uh, she immediately became part of this community, uh, raised her large family and uh, adapted beautifully. Mother's been involved in the arts since she was a kid. Uh, she grew up in New York and her mother took them to all kinds of theatrical performances, museums. And so when she moved to Lubbock during the war, when Daddy was overseas, to have me, she was really concerned that she wanted to be sure her children were exposed to as much as she had been. 
And in, in the 40s in Lubbock, that was a little bit challenging. So she's been involved. We, we all, I'm the oldest of six, and we all participated in little theater performances. We traveled, we did all kinds of lessons. Uh, some of us took piano lessons, some of us took dancing lessons. You know, so somebody's always had a, a toe in one door or the other. So we've all been involved in everything there was to be involved in in Lubbock as long as I can remember. So we always had a baseball team, it seems like here. And we had the the uh, boxing. And uh, by golly, that was about it. Uh, and of course, the uh, little theater. And living in a college town, of course, you're gonna, mm -hmm. you know, and it was such a tiny uh, school at that time. And tiny town, it was, there were 35,000 people here when I came, when Jane yeah. was born. So we made our own fun. We had lots mm -hmm. of treasure hunts. <laughs> it, is it fair to ask uh, if this was, uh, if you felt a little bit like you were uh, being banished to the uh, French Foreign Legion? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> if you can imagine. Another thing she did that was that's different, um, was that she She really believed that you need to have bodies in the chairs. So she showed up at everything. And she took us, all of us, all our kids. Um, she had artist friends. She would go to all the exhibits and the galleries and meet people. And a number of people have said that, you know, at one point the tornado hit and Linwood Krennic <laughs> said that all of his work was being framed and the only thing that didn't blow away was what Mother had and what Linwood had at their houses. So, you know, she was she was a good friend of the artists before they got well known. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, I had a date in college, <clears throat> first date. So, Grandma was inviting me to play at the university. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be real impressive. You know, I'll take her to this date with my grandma. My gosh, I'm a caring kid. And she took me to Equus. And I don't know if you've ever been to Equus, but eventually the guy ends up in his underwear with a horse. It's kind of a strange deal. And about halftime, it breaks. And I'm sitting between my date and my grandma. I'm going, oh, my Lord, that man is in the, riding that horse in his underwear. What in the world? Yeah, I didn't have another date with Jamie after that. But Grandmother she took us to everything. She said she likes serious, hard-thinking, challenging theater. I, as an artsy fartsy individual, um, she encouraged us so much. You know, any any of us that said, "Hey, I want to try this," or "I want to try that," um, and and when she could, she came out to everything. I did a play down here on Thirty Fourth Street. I don't want to speak ill of it, but it wasn't very popular. So one night, I think we looked out before the you know before we <laughs> started, and it was like this guy had one friend, and this girl had a boyfriend, and I had grandma. And there were like literally four to six people there. We knew them all. We were like, can't we just take them out for a beer? You know, just, <laughs> just forget the show. But she sat through the whole thing and and she had notes, you know, she's like, you were good, you know, and this and this this could have been better and this, but she she sucked it all in. She just loved the theater, which is probably why I'm crazy. I think she, she always said that she wasn't an artist herself, but her, she saw her role as a connector, that she could introduce people who were interested in something to other people who might be and want to be involved in it. And I think that was one of her. Yeah, certainly she, she would ha host parties here at her house and uh, invite people from different walks of life, city council maybe, uh, artists, uh, any of the big players in town. And then she'd have them sitting next to each other and, and talking so that they were sharing ideas and, and things that could advance their their purpose. We began to work uh, together on various community projects as well as being friends, but of course the most important was without question the uh, foundation of the board that would lead to the establishment of the Louise Hopkins Underwood Center for the Arts. When 
have some we have some pictures right here, and while we frame these up, Mrs. Underwood, many have pointed to you at being the inspiration behind this entire process. And in fact, they're, they're, they've been so inspired by you that they are actually renaming the facility. And this is what an honor, the Louise Hopkins Underwood Center for the Arts. How does that make you feel? Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I'm still overwhelmed by that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have worked hard, but there have been so many that have worked right along with me. Uh, we've got representatives from the, all the arts groups and around our dining room tables is how this all of that came about. Louise had been thinking and talking about establishing some type of center where local and regional artists could display their work and have it appreciated uh, by people in this area. Gradually her thoughts began to come together and that there should also be a museum uh, or gallery, we would properly say, associated with it. Louise was very interested in getting this center together, uh, not to have her name on it. In fact, I think she resisted that. She was interested because she understood that the center was more than a physical place. It was more than a, a building. It was a, a collection of people. It was a culture. We were trying to get to a place that the artists could not only show their works, but sell them. They, they, you know, they they couldn't make a living outside of their professorship or whatever. But now they're, I, I think it's just been a tremendous uh, boost. And uh, so, and what CASP has done. We were friendly, I knew her, but uh, we became close through the affiliation between CASP and LUCA. The two nonprofits work together as much as we can. We try to support each other as much as we can. We consider ourselves completely separate and autonomous, but we share what we call a campus. She wanted LUCA to be a catalyst for all the arts as opposed to being a, a producer of art. She wanted LUCA to be some place where people could come and look at art and, and show their art. And so she's there for view, we're there for make, and we're a great partnership. It was to help artists, performers, actors, musicians have a place to come together and do their thing. And I think it's, you know, that whole complex, it wouldn't be the same without Charles's loving arms wrapped around the whole thing. But the, the combination has just made such a wonderful place for people who've never thought about throwing a clay pot or getting behind a metal, I don't even know enough about metal working to know what you get behind to do all that stuff. But anyway, you know, anything that gave people a chance to express themselves or to learn a new fun thing. I think it meant the world to her, but I think it also meant the world to everybody that touched it. I mean, you know, I'm a broke actor in California and I'd send $50, $100, you know, and just that was back when it was an old fire station and a pile of dirt. And to see what it's become, and I know I didn't give a whole lot, but I think that everybody that's darkened those doors feels that way. But it was her vision. And and it's, uh, I think, I really have this sneaking suspicion that she hung on till the 20th anniversary. You know, that but that really meant a lot. And, uh, and she was, I think every day she was blown away by what was going on up there. great successes, I think, is the First Friday Art Trail, which when we first started it was this building and across the street, and that was the extent of it. And uh, uh, that's all people had to do was come here and walk across, and not all of this was finished. It was all brand new. And yet, you know, we know what that's like today. It's, it's a, a, a major event in this community once a month. 
The reason individuals gave funds for its establishment and for its expansion into the campus that it is now, all really was because of Louise. People admired her, people liked her, they respected her and what she was doing. Frankly, if it had been someone else, I don't think that center would exist in the form that it now exists. And as long as she lived, she always went to every event, even if she went in a wheelchair toward the end of her life. Every month she would say, well, I don't know, maybe I'm too tired to go to the art trail. And then she'd say about four o'clock in the afternoon, oh, I think I better go one more time. So off we go and inevitably someone would come up to her and say, you're the reason, you and what, you're, what you've done down here are the reason I stayed in town. You know, or I grew up here and I never dreamed it would be this, that this many things coming from different directions would be available. You know, all kinds of new ideas and innovative ways to look at things and learn things. And it was just kind of um, rejuvenating. I started at Luca on the 28th and my very next Friday was First Friday. And um, she was omnipresent at First Friday. So that was my first meeting of Louise. And everybody had built her up and there was so much anticipation. And she was just this lovely human being who made everybody feel welcome and pleased to be there. Louise was extraordinarily proud of this place. And again, not because her name was on it, but because it represented a fulfillment of the dreams of a lot of people from the, from the start, this idea of a campus. She was quite proud of what had happened. Also, uh, I hope that one of the things she recognized, although she, you couldn't get her to say this either, was that she was this perfect mediating influence on the various factions uh, in creating something like this at the same time that she inspired them. And that's tough to do. Uh, it's one thing to be the uh, 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 hall monitor, you know, when you have uh, people with varying uh, uh, stakes in a big endeavor like this. But to be able to uh, keep uh, the kids from scruffling around in the halls and inspire them to do better, that's a real talent. things that I do every year, and I've done this for years, is I take a small group of fourth year medical school students right before they graduate, and I try to work with the hospices around town and ask the hospice if I could have a patient that my students could interview. As they're actively dying, I got a call from hospice and said, we've got, got it set up. We have a very special patient for you. I had never met Louise Hopkins Underwood before. Um, so this was very special to me. Of course, everyone knows her in Lubbock. And so it was really a treat. And I thought, wow, what a, what a generous lady to, to do this. I had no idea that we actually met with her about 96 hours before she died. That's when I met her. So that context is important because she struck me and left such an impression on me and also my medical students. Um, I ended up taking six students with me that day. Uh, Louise was at home in her beautiful home and invited us in. I, that, first of all, just struck me as incredibly generous and uh, really over and above what uh, you, you would expect someone who's dying to do. So was incredibly appreciative of that. She was sitting up in bed. She had her makeup was perfect. Um, I knew that she had been in the hospital, but you would never have known it in the way that she carried herself, the way that she presented herself. More than that, usually when I meet with, with folks who are at this condition, we'll meet for about 15 or 20 minutes. Oh, no, 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 not with Louise Hopkins Underwood. She kept us there for an hour and a half. And I finally said, I, I am sure that we are wearing you out. And you would never have known that she lacked a bit of energy. The next day, we got a thank you note from her. We got a note from her 
saying thank you for coming, thank you for, for bringing you, those beautiful medical students to, to talk with me. It really made my day and I thought, wow, this is a very special person. I've never gotten that before. I've been doing this a long time, but she's, she's remarkable. The weekend before she died, she went to the, she went to the gala, she, the Luca Gala, which she didn't dream she was, but after all, it was the 20th anniversary, so she better get up and go. And then she went to, um, she went to First Friday Art Trail. She went to the theater because they had um, Raisin in the Sun, which had never been performed in Lubbock. She went out to the Ag Museum and saw the old train car and looked around out there and met her great granddaughter. Yeah, Cheryl's met her, her, sec, her, her newest great grandchild, and then was gone. <laughs> it's just yeah, but remarkable. on the on the way out, she uh, in her final hours, <laughs> she <laughs> really? made she wanted to make sure that we hired a bartender. And got out the good china. Got out the good china. <laughs> <laughs> so she knew she was leaving. <laughs> she really did change the fiber of life in Lubbock. You know, she changed the culture here. Uh, we were more than cotton and football after Louise got hold of Lubbock. And I think that is, that's huge. I often think about what Louise was able to accomplish. She started Luca when she was 78 years old. When she passed away, my little hashtag that I did on Facebook when we were all kind of posting our, our sadness about Louise being gone was live like Louise. And the more I've thought about that, I'm, more, I'm like, hey, I've got a 20 year jump on her. I could, I could actually maybe do something at 52. She left Lubbock better than she found it. I think it was uh, my Uncle Busty that said it first. He, I called him crying and he said, uh, he said, there's no reason any, any Sadness on our part is selfish. But she checked every box you can imagine and then some extras, which is really, really awesome. And she'd lived a good long life and she was ready to go. You know, it was it was time. Her her body was wearing out or fortunately her mind didn't wear out any. There were there weren't anything wasn't anything that she she wasn't able to say she did. I mean oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm gonna tell this story. But I was in Costa Rica. And, uh, <laughs> I can't believe you're going to tell this story either. <laughs> so uh, I was in Costa Rica and I went to this bar that was just fantastic. I mean, you're you're in Central America, so you you know you don't see bars that remind you of home. And there's this long wooden bar with pictures of Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings on the on the wall. And I mean, I was just loving it. And I called mom and I was like, man, I am. I think I found the coolest bar. But then. Uh, Somebody told me that it's a whorehouse upstairs. So, you had a lot of luck with your dates, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I took a date. And so uh, <laughs> so mom told grandma, and grandma was like, oh, I've been there. Yeah, they got a little hair salon right next door. <laughs> so, if you go to the left, it's the beauty shop. If you go to the right, it's the whorehouse. <laughs> so what's wrong with me? I'm the only one who's not been to the whorehouse in Costa Rica. <laughs> but she was that kind of a mother that you would... David said, I can't believe I'm calling my mother to tell this. And I said, well, I'm going to call my mother and tell her. <laughs> so it's a long family heritage. Louise changed my life. She changed the course of my life. And she's also changing the course of other people's lives. And she'll do it long after she's gone through her facility, through this arts district. We have interns that work in these facilities and Subsequently, when they look for new jobs, when they hit the market, they're not just a master's student, they're a master's student with experience. And she enabled that to happen. So she's changing kids' lives as well as the general public's. Knowing Louise, all those years, five decades, that uh, it was not only a great experience to have a friend like Louise, uh, but to know well someone who truly made a positive impact on a great number of people and on the community in which he lived. Louise's um, death, her physical death, is a uh, uh, a reminder that, first of all, even if you're as spry and sharp and 
uh, with it as Louise was right up to the end that we're, we're all going to go. <laughs> we're, you know, it reminds us of our own mortality, but it also reminds us that irrespective of what religious belief you may have or worldview about what happens to a soul when it's gone, you don't have to look very far uh, from Louise's life to see that uh, there's a lot that is still alive about Louise. This place is one thing, uh, but her, her children, her friends, all of us who were influenced by her, uh, that still goes on. And I think our challenge is not uh, how do we uh, continue uh, the work of Louise. She would want us to say, how do we continue our own work? And uh, that is maybe as big and important a gift as anyone could ever give you as an artist. I think right now there's a wonderful spirit downtown. I think there's a wonderful momentum happening. There's a wonderful symbiotic relationship between tech and, and downtown, and they're getting more off campus and doing, I just think there are great things happening all over. But it's very easy just to get on the Marsha Sharp and go back to the Southland and never come out. And I think if, we, if we're not careful, we'll, we're, we're, we can lose it all again. It's going to be dependent on all of us to um, show up. I can't tell you how many times Mother would call and say, let's go to so-and-so, and I'd think, I can't do another thing. And then I would be so happy I didn't miss it because they're, I, you know, it's, I just... And, and something would come from that, right? Yeah. You'd learn something there that would take it, you over here, and exactly. bam, you were helping something over there. Exactly. She's amazing. Yeah. We've got a lot of work to do. <laughs>